Hello and welcome back to Guillotined 18th Century Chemist Theater. Today we are going to attempt to wrap up the periodic table by hitting the main block elements, uh, which is a supergroup composed of not only many of the families we talked about already, but some of them that we haven't. And there are some really big elements in here, so it's going to be pretty hard to do them justice under 10 minutes, but we'll give it a shot. So as I said, the main block elements are uh, a supergroup of other families, groups 1, 2, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, three of which we've already talked about, the alkali metals, the alkaline earth metals, and the halogens. Um, they're often called the representative elements because they're representing so many different properties found throughout the periodic tables. So think about the United Nations. I mean, you're representing certain uh, countries that want this and certain countries that want that. You've got certain elements that want to lose valence electrons. We've got certain elements that want to gain valence electrons. So it can be a little bit uh, chaotic at times to look at the entire group. Really, everybody's a part of the main block elements, except for the transition metals and the noble gases. Um, group 16, by the way, are, are often known as the calcogens, the chalk formers. That's an official uh, name. Some unofficial names on the periodic table would be group 15, the nictogens, and group 11, although it's not a transition, I mean, although it's not a main block element, uh, the coinage metals. And what makes a name official is that it's recognized by the IUPAC, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. So if you want to name an element, you got to get past them. And so the first uh, element that we will not do justice to today is carbon. A carbon gets its own discipline, in fact, organic chemistry. Uh, anything dealing with carbon and carbon compounds is usually covered there, and that's why we don't really cover much organic chemistry and first-year chemistry. We tend to focus on inorganic chemistry. Now, the name organic and inorganic uh, sort of is a throwback to older times. Organic used to mean coming from living items, but we long have since been able to create organic molecules in the laboratory, the first of which is urea. And so you can do a little research where urea is found naturally, so that was a big coup when we <laughs> figured out how to do that. Um, there are many carbon-containing gases that we do worry about, though, in inorganic chemistry, uh, like carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. Um, of course, then there's also methane. Uh, there's many allotropes of carbon, and uh, really we can't overstate how uh, important carbon is to society. Although we are technically carbon-based life forms, um, we really are carbon-based uh, civilization. Really, it's, it's embedded itself in all parts of our life. So, go carbon. And I encourage you to take entire courses on it. <laughs> Another element that I can't really do justice to uh, is nitrogen. Nitrogen, 78% of our atmosphere, has a very strong bond because it's a, it's a, it's a certain type of diatomic. Um, it actually forms a triple bond with itself. And so although we have tons of nitrogen around us, very little of it is usable. Um, only lightning and then certain bacteria in legumes, symbiotically in their uh, nodules, uh, have the ability to break up nitrogen naturally. And so nitrogen is a huge important uh, element though because we use it in fertilizers. It's often the limiting reactant to plant growth and also explosives uh, because uh, if we want to make something uh, explode we need uh, nitrogen and uh, the only place to really get that in nature is probably nitrogen high poop and, and a great example of that would be bat guano. And so uh, Europe was, was really literally starving to death in the early 20th century. And, and so there was a call to arms uh, to try to figure out a way to get nitrogen out of the air. And the one who successfully answered this was a, a, a German chemist named Fritz Haber. And uh, again, to certainly not do his story justice, uh, he was able to come up with a process where um, he pulled nitrogen from the air and then reacted it with hydrogen gas in a special process uh, and was able to create NH3 ammonia. And once he had ammonia, uh, he was able to then convert that to any other compound needed for fertilizers or explosives. Now, Fritz Haber was an extremely complex character. Um, during World War I, he worked on the uh, German gas warfare project, and that's why some people wanted to try him as a war criminal after World War I. He tried to figure out a way to pay Germany's war reparations by getting gold out of seawater. And, uh, of course, uh, he was involved with this process, which led not only to fertilizers, which ended up feeding the world, and it's the only reason why we can support our population today is because of the work of Fritz Haber and creating artificial fertilizers, uh, but then also went on to become uh, a way that we could produce explosives. And so uh, that actually gave Germany one of the reasons it was able to do what it did in World War I, 
because uh, it didn't have many internal sources of nitrogen, so it could have been easily blockaded and shut down in any war. But once the, 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 the Haber process uh, was created, uh, then it had a source of internal explosives and was able to sustain itself that way. Uh, these, these plants uh, helped design by a guy named uh, Carl Bosch. And uh, so if you ever want to know the difference between a chemist and a chemical engineer, you want to look at the difference between these two. And there's a great book called The Alchemy of Air, which talks about these two men and how they uh, ended up creating this and the ramifications of that. Fantastic book. Um, much shorter than the uh, making of the atomic bomb, uh, but, but very much worth the read. So anyway, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave you to learn more about the interesting life of Fritz Haber uh, later. Again, interesting from beginning to end. Um, some people, to some people he's a patriot, to some people he's a, he's a criminal. Uh, but nonetheless, the world has been um, radically changed by his existence. Because again, if, if his work were to disappear right now, uh, we wouldn't be able to feed the planet. By the way, that was a picture of him with Einstein. Uh, they were contemporaries, and it was interesting um, how they had a different take on, on what governments did and what governments were for. Anyway, we do have a couple other elements to hit here in the time we have left. Oxygen, 21% of the atmosphere, most of what's left after nitrogen. Uh, interestingly enough, oxygen is the most abundant element in the Earth's crust due to the fact that it's in uh, silicon dioxide sand. Um, and, and of course, there are some popular uh, uh, allotropes of oxygen. Uh, the diatomic and the uh, uh, ozone molecule. Silicon, again, entire industry is built around this, this element. Uh, so it's one of the metalloids, and so its semiconductivity has made it super important for, for many decades now. In fact, it's the only reason that you're watching this lesson. And finally, we'll touch on hydrogen. Uh, most of you recognize that as the Hindenburg there. Uh, the Hindenburg was a big story because it was filled with hydrogen. Hydrogen is a, as, as a unique element. Uh, it can gain one valence electron. It can lose one valence electron. Um, it is the most abundant element in the universe. That's the lightest. So that's a little fun trivia that you see every now and then. Um, and it is a very reactive element uh, because it wants to uh, gain a full outer shell. Um, and usually it does it by losing an electron. So even diatomic hydrogen is very reactive because it will split up and form different compounds. And that was the problem with the Hindenburg um, is the fact that uh, when, when it ignited, uh, that hydrogen then sought out oxygen. It didn't explode because there was no oxygen inside of it, but as that hydrogen found oxygen, it started reacting. You can find videos of the Hindenburg, of course, uh, throughout the internet. Uh, you might want to check that out as if you've never watched it before. Now, it can gain an electron, and those would be called uh, hydrides, um, but you typically see it losing a hydrogen. If you, slip, if you strip off that uh, electron, you get a Berenicate proton. And that's really the, the basis of acid chemistry. Um, and then pretty much if you, if you take hydrogen and strip off the electron, uh, when that bare naked proton's floating around, that's what chemists will call an acid, is really protons floating around in water. Um, and again, like, like carbon, it's really uh, an incredibly important chemical to both uh, uh, fertilizers and, and many organic chemistry and industrial applications. And, and again, I, I do feel bad. I feel like I, I uh, didn't give any of those elements their proper due. But it's, it's a good start to dip your toes in the water. And so that's it. That's our journey of the periodic table. We'll, we'll talk a lot more about it later to talk about some of the trends we didn't talk about now once we have a little bit more background about molecular structure and uh, where electrons really belong. Actually, really atomic structure, but uh, that feeds into molecular structure. So uh, that's it. I uh, hope you learned something. Thanks for watching. And have a great day.